Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to the latest edition of You Make the Call. I'm going to show you one slide, two images, and I'm going to ask you for an answer. It's not always going to be easy. It's going to make you think, and hopefully we'll all learn something together. So, let's get started. This patient has hematuria, and I'm giving you two images. The image on the left is a MIP. image on the right is just a coronal uh, image. Excretory phase. What's the cause of hematuria? Now, one challenge in this case is the calyces in the left kidney you may wonder about. It's not well distended. One challenge in CT sometimes is the calyces are not always well distended. But let's focus on the right side for a moment. Look at the upper pole calyces in the right kidney. You can see the calyces are distorted, they're irregular, they're infiltrated, and that's bad. That's the sign of a tumor. It's not a stricture like you would think about with tuberculosis. Um, you gotta be thinking tumor. And when you see the calyces and maybe the pelvis involved, you gotta be thinking about a transitional cell carcinoma. So the best answer here is a TCC of the patient's upper pole right kidney. I'm showing you a simple coronal view without showing you the MIP. You can see the soft tissue in the upper pole. There's blood clot in the bladder. One recommendation is when you're looking at the calyces in the ureter, always look at a thin slab MIP. It's very helpful for looking at the calyces and looking for distortion or cutoff. Again, if the calyces are not filled, you could potentially overcall the findings in the left kidney, but I don't think you're going to have an issue in the real world because you would have had all of the other images. And if you look, for example, on the image on your left, the left kidney looks fine, and you would not have called it and said, oh, there must be an infiltrating process, and that's why the calyces are not well seen on the single MIP image. What about this case, hematuria? I'll give you arterial phase and excretory phase. This case is quite, kind of easy, and I just wanted to add it to the last case. You can see the infiltration, the structure of the upper pole calyces on the right, the soft tissue mass slightly vascular on early phase imaging. This was also likely going to be a transitional cell carcinoma. Now, from the first image, you still could say renal cell carcinoma, but you know you're dealing with a tumor. This is not inflammatory disease. This is something infiltrating. Excretory phase, we speak about why do you need excretory phase in hematuria? Well, that's the reason. Things like transitional cell carcinomas, we also know pyelonephritis, may not be seen unless you have excretory phase imaging. Just a beautiful example in this case. And so the answer was a TCC. Here's just a couple axial images, and then the two images I gave you that allowed you to make the diagnosis of a TCC. An incidental finding, you see arterial and venous phase imaging. You see about a five centimeter vascular mass in the right lobe of the liver. And then on the venous phase, it's gone. You can kind of see where it was by the hepatic veins. What becomes isodense? Well, if you wait long enough, everything in the liver becomes isodense. Hepatomas, vascular metastasis, hepatic adenomas, AV malformations, hemangiomas, and focal nodular hyperplasia. What is very vascular, but only as vascular as the IVC and not the aorta, that quickly becomes isodense without any true mass effect and as a central scar like in this case. You go through the differential vascular, but only the IVC. Central scar. Yes, central scars can be seen in cholangios, in fibrolamella hepatomas, but FNH is the one you think about, and it becomes vascular but only as bright as the IVC and quickly becomes isodense. This was a beautiful example of FNH. FNHs are incidental findings, no malignant potential, but they can grow over time. It's the second most common benign liver lesion after hemangioma. It's more common in women, 
can be multiple in up to 20% of cases. Most of the lesions are under five centimeters, but some can be larger. They can hang off the liver, so can be tricky. They can grow over time. Again, the key is being able to make the diagnosis confusion to things like hepatic adenoma, atypical hemangioma, hepatoma are all possibilities, but usually we have no problem making the right diagnosis. If you're uncertain, MR can be helpful. Patient with right upper quadrant pain, what's the diagnosis? Well, what you're looking at here is a complex cystic lesion with calcifications in the right lobe of the liver. It's not a hydatid cyst. Those are multiple cysts with rim calcification. It's not a simple cyst. It's not an infected cyst. It's not a bioloma. What could it be? Complex cystic lesion. Well, maybe it's hepatoma. They can be cystic, but complicated? Well, maybe. Calcification could be mucinous adenocarcinoma, metastatic to the liver. Again, such a large mass, such septations. I don't know about that, but it could be. It's not going to be FNH. It's not hepatic adenoma. It's not a complex cyst in a patient with polycystic liver disease. But you need to think about what other cystic lesions are there. We used to talk about cyst adenomas or cyst adenocarcinomas of the liver. Uh, we used to talk about how you would try to distinguish what was benign and what was malignant. Now it's felt that all of these cyst adenomas or cyst adenocarcinomas have malignant potential and will be resected. The classic appearance is this, a biliary cyst adenoma. Cystic, septations, calcification, can be small, can be large, and difficult to distinguish from a malignancy. Patient has back pain. What's the diagnosis? Well, there's a vascular lesion in the tail of the pancreas, and when you look at the MIP, the lesion has calcification. I could give you a number of reasons for vascular pancreatic lesions. Top of the list, I'm putting neuroendocrine. Then maybe I put metastatic renal cell carcinoma. But what else gives you calcification? Calcification and vascularity in the, in the pancreas, you're running out of things. It's not adenocarcinoma. It's not going to be, you know, a mucinous tumor. Yes, serous adenomas and MCNs all can have calcifications, but those are punctate calcifications, not dense, coarse calcifications that are fairly extensive in a vascular lesion. This is the classic appearance. Let me not delay the answer any further. This is a neuroendocrine tumor of the pancreas a neuroendocrine tumor, classic calcifications, classic vascularity, a very important diagnosis to make. Okay, let's go on. What about this case? Abdominal pain, there's a cystic lesion under 2CM in the tail of the pancreas. I apologize, I'm not giving you more images, but what do you got to think of? Well, you think of about IPMN, but then you usually have some communication with the duct. I don't see the duct. Could it be an MCN? It's the right location, possible, but it looks like it has some enhancement at the edge. MCNs can have rim calcification, can have enhancement, but usually don't. When you see a cystic lesion with rim enhancement, I don't care where it is, I don't care what size it is, they're usually are smaller ones. You gotta be thinking about a neuroendocrine tumor, so you need to sample this lesion. Yes, I still consider an MCN as a possibility. This lesion was sampled, eventually resected, and it was a neuroendocrine tumor of the pancreas. We talk about vascular lesions as neuroendocrine tumors, but they can be cystic with rim-like enhancement. It's atypical, but it does occur. We see it all the time. What about this case? Just to show you, lightning does strike. Here's another patient, same location, cystic lesion. You can see the enhancement. It's not an IPMN, there's no dilated duct. You could think about an MCN, but I'll tell you the patient was older and was male. This also was a neuroendocrine tumor. You see the enhancement here as well. Cystic neuroendocrine tumors, sometimes they're small and obstruct the pancreatic duct, but often they're just like this and they can be blown off as IPMNs. Remember, IPMNs don't need to have a dilated duct, 
but the side branch lesions typically communicate with the duct. There's no communication in this case. Fever and cough. Well, what can I tell you? There's a cavitary lesion right up a lobe. Yes, you should think about neoplasm with cavitation and patchy enhancement or hemorrhage around the lesion. But, you know, the way it looks, that central soft tissue density, the big cavity, what looks like inflammation or theoretically hemorrhage, you got to be thinking infection. TB is a great thought, especially if immunocompromised patients, this could be, you might think about aspergillosis, something infecting a prior cyst. Septic emboli, we do get cavitation, but the nodule is not great for that. But what about, what else? And the area around it, is it hemorrhage, is it infection? You gotta be thinking infection. TB is a great thought. Histoplasmosis, only because you mentioned TB. A number of the other organisms. This was histoplasmosis. Active histo with cavity, with nodule, with infiltrate around. An unusual appearance, but something we should think about. At least we would have been in the range with TB and other infectious processes. Well, that's it, guys. I gave you a bunch of cases. So for me, for all of us at CTS Us, I hope you enjoyed uh, this set of cases, this new series we've come up with, and I'll see you next time. Have a great day. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.